It's my pleasure to reintroduce Professor Frederica Nusso this evening for the last of this year's Annie Kincaid Warfield Lectures. Her distinction and accomplishments as a systematic theologian have been articulated by other introductions this week, so I will not belabor them here, except to say how grateful we are that she has been with us this week to deliver these lectures. I understand from our communications team that the online audience for these lectures in terms of viewers who are watching or have watched the lectures this week is quite large, more than we have had for any lecture series in memory. And I am not surprised. It is a real privilege to hear a systematic theologian at the level of eminence that Dr. Newsell brings, but it is a double privilege to have that systematic theologian be a woman, for distinction of this kind in this field is still for women rare. Um, so that we're very, very grateful to have you here. And the title of this, Dr. Newsell's uh, final lecture, is The Spirit of Freedom and the Human. So please join me in welcoming her again this evening. Thank you very much again for a very nice and kind um, welcome. Um, <clears throat> and I begin uh, with proclamation, reconciliation, and the experience of freedom. Next to love, freedom is surely the theme of the Christian faith with the most appeal. <laughs> freedom is the theme of Reformed and Lutheran Protestantism with interesting, is interestingly different accentuations. It is the theme of the political enlightenment and the French Revolution. It is the theme fundamental <clears throat> to the founding and political history of this country to this day. We could have known, <clears throat> who could have known at the Boston Tea Party how important and supportive the freedom won there would become to those from whom it was freed. The notion of freedom, as far as I can see as onlooker from Europe, is the central concept this country has been and is continuously working out, not least in many social and scientific areas and currently especially in dealing with racism. When you fly from Europe to New York or go by boat or sail like Greta Thunberg, um, the first thing you see is the Statue of Liberty. The only reason for me to always take a window seat on the transatlantic flight, despite being pretty impractical for nine hours, is that I want to see New York and the symbols of freedom from above. On this current trip, I was beginning to think it wouldn't work out. Upstate New York was in thick clouds, as was the whole North Atlantic in general. But just before New York, the right amount of wind blow blew or should we say the Ruach, and there was a clear sunny view of New York. Behind me, an American murmured to his neighbor, I don't get tired of this view. He spoke, me to, from, uh, spoke to me from the soul. Why freedom symbols in the plural? Well, next to the Statue of Liberty is Ellis Island, and in a sense, the gateway to freedom for so many people who have arrived in the US and found a free life here. How deeply this experience sits with individuals was shown to me by a small everyday incident while shopping here in Princeton with my families years ago. We went to the checkout counter to pay for our groceries and the cashier started putting things in plastic bags. She had a distinct accent and was probably of Slavic, Slavic origin. I said to her, could I please have this without a bag? And she replied, of course, it's a free country. <laughs> freedom was uh, from persecution, oppression, or being forced into unwanted ways of life needs political institutions. It doesn't take long to see the history of these ideas uh, spending even a, a brief moment in Philadelphia at an Independence Hall with the Liberty Bell. 
The Liberty Bell is a powerful symbol, which can be seen not least in the fact that shortly after the Second World War, the idea arose to bring a Liberty Bell to Berlin. The idea came up in the USA in 1949, when the National Committee for a Free Europe was founded. This committee was headed by General Lucius Clay, the father of the Berlin Airlift. Donations were collected in the US, the bell was made and sent on a crusade for freedom across the USA on its way to Berlin. There it hangs in uh, the tower of the Schöneberger Rathaus. <clears throat> the entire idea had political support, of course, from both the government and the CIA. <laughs> The bell became a prominent symbol in Germany of America's close relationship with, with West Berlin after the war. It still holds a large presence in Germany. It rings every day at 12 o'clock. This ringing is broadcast every day on the radio station Deutschland Radio Kultur. It also rings on May 1st, Christmas Eve, New Year's Day, and on all serious world history events such as German reunification on October 3, 1990, and on September 13, 2001, two days after 9-11, it rang for a full seven minutes, and thousands of Berliners, Berliners paid tribute to the victims um, on John F. Kennedy Place. Fortunately, the bell had just been repaired a few months earlier. The two bells are symbols of freedom, and the bell in Germany is also a symbol of liberation and reconciliation. Symbols do not work without explanation. Theologically, they are useless without proclamation. Proclamation and symbols or mediums in their interrelationship are essential to the experience of reconciliation and the idea of freedom. Conversely, the idea of freedom shapes one's self-perception and in connection with such uh, self-perception, one's perception of social and political conditions. This basic correlation can already be found in Paul's discussion of freedom, which became seminal for the Reformation movements in the 16th century and beyond. Paul's understanding, <coughs> uh, Paul understands reconciliation as liberation. Greek Stoic uh, thinking about freedom is in the background of Paul, as Samuel Vollenweider has shown. At the same time, Paul also sets himself apart from the Hellenistic understanding of freedom. For him, freedom is grounded in the liberating event of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thus, as he claims in Galatians 5, verse, uh, verse 1, the freedom Christ has set us free, uh, the, to freedom Christ has set us free. And, but where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom in 2 Corinthians 3. In Romans 8, Paul explains freedom as liberation from the yoke of bondage under the law and sin and death. And thus, at the same time, from carnal existence. This bondage is replaced by the uh, law of the spirit, which makes one alive in Jesus Christ and gives a spiritual attitude. Paul does not leave it at the juxtaposition of the existence under the law and the existence in the spirit, but asks how one can be sure of the presence of the spirit. His answer is, the spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are God's children. In a particular, a particular way, the spirit is the source of freedom because the spirit gives the assurance of filiation, of belonging to Christ. Freedom is grounded in the belonging to Christ. For Paul, this liberation from the bondage of the law and the dominance of the flesh not only has manifold social consequences, as he makes clear in 1 Corinthians 7, the liberation also has a cosmic and eschatological dimension. For even creation, groaning, and in tribulation will be set free from the bondage of corruption and liberated to the glorious freedom of the children of God. Paul is not the only New Testament author who deals with freedom. John also understands freedom as being an opposite to bondage, whereby bondage consists directly of sin or unbelief. Accordingly, liberation through Christ leads to truth, 
Finally, the author of, the, uh, of Jacob um, offers a third interpretation of liberation by determining the love commandment from Leviticus 19.18 as the law of freedom uh, in Jacob 2.8. In the book of Jacob, freedom is thereby the consequence of such an action in which Christians obey the law. Thus, unlike as we see in Paul, law is combined with freedom. Even if Greek notions of freedom form an important background of the New Testament claims, there is also the primordial historical date of Israel's liberation from bondage in Egypt. Already in the New Testament, differences, different emphases in the understanding of freedom can be found. In the 16th century, the various Reformation movements were inspired differently by the biblical concept of freedom and drew different conclusions. The Lutherans emphasized the liberation of the individual from work righteousness in faith and the liberation to selfless devotion to one's neighbor. The reformed had a stronger emphasis on the realization of freedom in the Christian community. The Anabaptists, on the other hand, took the complete transformation of the communal life or way of life according to Christian rules very seriously, especially in the then necessary removal of state regulations. The idea of freedom and the experience of freedom are in a continuous interrelation. In the age of enlightenment at, uh, at the latest, the idea of freedom became separate, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, separate from religious context. Yet the connection between the experience of freedom and the thought of freedom is and remains inescapable. Kant, Hegel, and the other German idealists developed their understanding of freedom within the context of the French Revolution. In left Hegelianism, they were, they were transformed into political theories in which, to, uh, in, uh, which in turn inform in many modifications ideas and ideals for free societies to this day. Economic developments in modernity have sometimes had a very subtle influence on notions of freedom. The combination of a market economy and a welfare sta state is the decisive piece holding it all together. Germany, for example, has a strong welfare state, and this has an impact on both the perception of economic processes and on citizens' needs for freedom. The importance of religion for the understanding of freedom is increasingly becoming less important. A few years ago, the Protestant church in Germany launched a process, a reform process, with the slogan, Church of Freedom. The reform has two emphases. On the one hand, it is about an internal reform process, since the churches will foreseeably not, no longer have the financial um, uh, nor the human resources they currently have. On the other hand, the process is directed outwardly. With Church of Freedom, the intention was to make the value of religion and the church clear. So far, the effect has been rather marginal. Among the unintended external effects, unfortunately, was, above all, the reaction of the Roman Catholic Church, which considered the Protestant advertisement of freedom as encroaching and ecumenically unfriendly. In any case, it has become very difficult to explain to a largely secular society why the Christian religion and why church life are conducive to freedom. After 9-11, Jürgen Habermas devoted more attention to the question of what significance religion has or should have for the modern ideologically neutral constitutional state. In his reflections, Habermas followed the constitutional um, lawyer Jürgen Böckenförde, who once claimed that the ideologically neutral state lives on an ideal presupposition it cannot provide itself. Habermas has modified the thesis somewhat. His diagnosis is that citizens in a civil constitu constitutional state must agree to the same principles in order for it to exist. But they cannot derive the motivation to do so from moral reason alone, since to do so is always in danger of falling into the trap of defeatism. 
Religions, on the, the other hand, have the semantic potential in their traditions that provides the motives for not surrendering to defeatism. That's Habermas' diagnosis. He illustrated the premise with the potential of the idea of the kingdom of God, which according to his analysis, Kant had already used to give moral reason a motive. With this revi um, revelation of religion, <coughs> re-evaluation of a religion compared to his earlier works, Habermas also connected the affordance that religions bring their religious ideas into social discourse in a ra rational translation. The Christian churches in Germany do this in many ways, but it is insufficient. People lack the experience of the working of the spirit. They seek their experience um, of freedom elsewhere. The persuasive power of the Christian faith is ultimately based, and this is my conviction, on Christian congregational life. Here, church development is caught in a vicious circle. The more the churches lose member, the less attractive they are, the more their resources dwindle, and the less they can be present in the cities and especially in the rural areas. Theological education is only one building block in the operation, but not an insignificant one. For without a good sense of theological direction, one cannot discern the needs and possibilities which brings me back to the opening thesis in the, in the first lecture. We cannot dispense with dogmatic orientation. Since I have been teaching theology at the university, I've be, uh, noticed that one question particularly preoccupies the students, that is the question of theodicy, at least my students. Um, I spoke briefly about theodicy in lecture three uh, in relation to physical evil. In the following, um, um, the question of moral evil and its origin um, was indirectly discussed. Now I would like to take it up explicitly in the question of the freedom of the spirit. Conceiving divine freedom, the spirit blows where the spirit wills, says Jesus to Nicodemus. This sentence has a great history of impact. In many cases, the sentence has been inter interpreted to mean that the spirit is unavailable, that one cannot subject the spirit's work to human expectations. According to the, the understanding stemming from the Reformation, the spirit is bound to the word, but when and where the spirit works through the work, is, through the word is up to the spirit alone. In the last three lectures, I have broken down the work of the spirit dogmatically. The spirit works in creation as a life-giving dynamis, making diversity possible. The spirit works in redemption as the gift of knowledge of sin and grace that enters into perceptual patterns as well as the emotional world. In reconciliation, the spirit becomes the medium of presence through which people are gathered in such a way that they can experience their community in faith and know themselves united in it. God, in the work of the Spirit through the Son, binds God's self to creation and specifically to, to human beings, whom God created in the power of the Spirit and sustains through God's redemptive and reconciling word, work. In this way, God confronts human sin, that is, moral evil. But why did God allow sin? Clearly, this question alone brings us back to the problem of theodicy, which I already touched. In the German context, the question arises in a special way based on our history with the Nazi regime, the cruel war, and especially the genocide for which Auschwitz stands. Here in this country, the question arises in a special way with regard to the history of the deportation of Africans to America, their enslavement, and all the subsequent problems connected with it. William R. Jones contends, quote, that engagement with the concept of theodicy has to be central to the work of anyone focused upon the annihilation of oppression with the objective goal to eliminate the, eliminate the suffering that is the heart of oppression. He urges that the, quote, theologian or philosopher of libera liberation must engage in the enterprise of theodicy. End quote. 
Moreover, Kerry Day's essay on uh, the doctrine of God in the Handbook of African American Theology um, provides helpful dogmatic orientation needed, especially for those not in the immediate context, also showing there is a wide spectrum of answers to these difficult problems. One end of the spectrum can be found in humanist positions, which William Jones and Anthony Pinn defend as a response to the problem of suffering in general and the suffering of the racially despised. In his article on the question at, um, at the end of theodicy, Pinn claims that the suffering of African Americans from oppression and racial disregard is currently topped by the fact that black life with a permanent, uh, live, uh, black people live with a permanent risk of being at the wrong place at the wrong time, which involves a fundamental challenge to the, uh, one's right to occupy physical space and time. This is clearly a severe problem regarding human freedom and equality. At the same time, Pin says the dilemma of rightful being in time and space promotes a particularly tenacious modality of anxiety tied to a sense that the pain and misery such circumstances entail has gone unnoticed, met with indifference. This more elemental, uh, elemental nudging toward meaninglessness brings the project of theodicy to an end in uh, Pin's, Pin's view. According to him, the only possible theodicy would involve interpreting suffering, at least indirectly, as merit. The argument Pin constructs to disclose its inadequacy sets out with the assumption that God is present and concerned with the good, and humans are real subjects of history whose existence is marked by injustice and mis misery which could entail that God is aware of injustice and misery and therefore must be okay with ongoing conditions. Should one not want to question the existence of God or God's goodness, one could only assume that misery must have a cosmic rational and that there must be some merit, at least indirectly, in suffering, um, Pin concludes. But such an approach to, uh, approach to theodicy, and this is Pin's point, provides an interpretation of suffering in terms of redemptive suffering that only further victimizes those who suffer most. The call suffering, um, redempt, uh, to call suffering redemptive or to claim it has some merit, however, is a challenge to the integrity of human life. I would definitely agree with Pin, and I found it quite interesting to read that. that um, and I would also agree that the theist uh, um, <coughs> framework that he describes provides an insufficient response to suffering. His description of the problem is comprehensive in all directions. And yet, from a biblical interpretation, I <coughs> can, uh, would, rather, uh, would rather subscribe to the position um, Larry G. Murphy puts forth, uh, which arguably, arguably represents the, the other side of the spectrum, namely that, quote, virtually all black Christian theological expressions have assumed and asserted that the Bible gives witness to the divine opposition to the evil of human suffering and to the divine mandate for human liberation with God actively working through and be, beyond human efforts to bring it about. End quote. I lack the background to go into the concepts of liberation theologies in detail. In the context of my pneumatological approach, my concern he here is to see what emerges from, for the theodicy question from the reflections so far on the work of the spirit. I have already spoken about physical evil and its partial connection with moral evil in lecture three. The real burning question now is how God can allow moral evil, how God can allow people to oppress, torture, disenfranchise um, other people, that is to cause them physical and mental suffering. In lecture four, I dealt with the question of what sin is and how it is recognized. I had interpreted sin as self-centeredness and self-assertion, taking many concrete forms some subtle, some highly violent and aggressive. Sin implies precisely that one does not limit oneself in relation to others and to God, 
but places oneself with self-interests at the center and immunizes oneself against per perspectives that are not one's own. The radicality of sin consists on the one hand in the radical forms in which people inflict suffering on one another, and on the other hand, anthropo anthropologically and structurally, in the fact that humans, can, uh, humans become entangled in sin, do not even recognize sin as sin, and accordingly cannot dis distance themselves from sin. It was not initially Leibniz who recognized the existence of sin or moral evil as a massive challenge to faith in God. Already Martin Luther, in his debate with Erasmus of Rotterdam on the unfree will, raised the question of God's justice. For Luther, a distinction is made here between the light of nature and the light of grace. In the light of nature, on the level of natural knowledge, it cannot be understood, according to Luther, Luther, why it is just that the good person suffers and the bad person does not. For Luther, it is, um, this question is solved only in light of grace, since in grace one recognizes what true justice and promise are. The righteous by faith will live. But on the level of the knowledge of grace, another question arises, namely the question why God gave humans the law all the while knowing humans as sinner will only fail to fulfill the law. This inquiry um, into the justice of God will only be cleared up in the light of the glory of God, Luther said. Leibniz posed the question somewhat differently in his dealings with the problem of evil. He wondered why God allowed sin, and, uh, sin or moral evil. I will therefore go into Leibniz's answer in more detail here because it makes it clearer what can and cannot be said in terms of dogmatic orientation. Leibniz's answer has two parts. On the one hand, it consists in the fact that, the traces, um, that he traces back the moral evil to metaphysical evil. God could create the world only in distinction from God's self. It is therefore not perfect in the same way as God. Human possibilities of knowledge are limited, not overlooking the consequences of one's actions completely. Therefore, if one uses freedom in the interaction of intellect and will, there is a danger that he will do the wrong thing and violate God's command. But then the question arises why God allows sin. The answer to this question is already in the title of Leibniz's fa famous um, work on theodicy. Um, the title is Essays on the Goodness of God, the Freedom of Man and the Origin of Evil. God allowed the possibility of sin because God wanted to create humans as free beings. Leibniz wants to explain existence of the evils with his theodicy. He gives an answer to the question from where evil and wickedness come, an answer. Thus, he goes philosophically beyond theology. For theology before and after Leibniz has always held back with an answer. First, an attempt at an answer clearly goes beyond the biblical text. The biblical texts tell us that sin occurs, but they do not tell us why. Second, a, an, any attempt at an explanation amounts to ascribing to God the responsibility for evil and wickedness to making God at the very least the indirect cause, unless one in, assumes a second principle to which evil and evil are attributed. Such dualism has always been rejected by Christian theology. Modern theologies therefore operate with three principles or, uh, at least German-speaking uh, theologies, as, as far as can, I can uh, see them, um, they operate with three pr principles or orienting categories. The first is, there is no second principle beside God. The second is, an answer to the question of the cause of the origin of evil cannot be given. And the third is, evil and wickedness must neither be underestimated as a power nor ontologized. Evil and wickedness are un underestimated, for example, in Augustine's description of <clears throat> them as a privatio boni, or much later in Hegel's description of them as necessary moment of transition in world history. 
To escape such understatements, Karl Barth created the concept of das Nichtige. Wie heißt das auf? Nothingness. Nothingness. However, the term is formulated in such a way that linguistically in German, it just does not insinuate its own content of being uh, or ontological status, since otherwise the problem of dualism would arise yet again. The question of theodicy thus brings one to the limit of linguistic possibilities of categorization. You cannot categorize evil and wickedness Neither can you minimize it nor ontologize it. Both are not possible since the dogmatic orientation of religious language implies one keeping both dangers in mind and avoiding an abstract categorization of evil and wickedness. Evil and wickedness can only be described from experience in their many different forms and degrees. Evil and wickedness are always one thing, anti-life and destructive. It remains to be examined whether it is helpful to explain moral evil as Leibniz did by saying that God wanted to give or gave freedom to humans, which implies that the existence of moral evil or the existence of a good God are compatible. One very influential philosophical approach in the 20th century is that of Alvin Plantinga in his book, God, Freedom and Evil. Challenged by uh, Mackey's critique of theism as positively irrational, the philosophical goal of Plantinga is to demonstrate the logical compatibility of the existence of a good, omnipotent, and omniscient God with the existence of evil. The point is not to prove the existence of, God, of a good God in spite of the existence of evil. The strategy is to disarm the attempt of what Plantinga calls natural atheology. Natural atheology is the attempt to prove that God does not exist or that at any rate it is unreasonable or irrational to believe that he does. Plantinga's response is part of his more fundamental attempt to assert theism as not only being rational, but that it would be rational to believe in God without any, ev any evidence at all. In his response to the atheologian conclusions from the existence of evil, the logical operation is the exclusion of the opposite. What Plantinga wants to exclude is the incompatibility claim as a necessary conclusion. His point is not to prove that the coexistence of God and evil is possible or even necessary. He only wants to demonstrate the co that the coexistence of God and evil is not logically incompatible. If this demonstration is successful, one important argument of a atheology is deconstructed, but just one. For a profound rejection of atheology, a further step is necessary. In the first part of the work, he deals with the problem of evil, and in the second part, the, he develops a natural theology in which he revisits the arguments of the existence of God. His goal here is to demonstrate that it is, un that it is reasonable to think that God exists as the being that has maximal excellence in this world only if he is omniscient, omnipotent, and perfectly good in that world. Again, he does not attempt to prove the existence of God as such, but to show that it is reasonable and rational to think of God as the omniscient, uh, omnipotent, and good creator of this world. What is important here is the specific character of Platinga's argument. Plantinga characterizes his approach as a defense and not a theodicy. A theodicy is, according to Plantinga, when a theist answers the question, when's evil, or why does God permit evil? This kind of approach he finds in Augustine and Leibniz. In contrast to them, he does not answer the why question, but only the question of compatibility, thus calling his approach a defense. And precisely in this limited intention, his argument is quite successful. It seems that, as Chart Meister notes, many now believe the logical problem of evil has for all intents and purposes been rebutted. Friedrich Hermanni, a philosopher of religion in Tübingen, comes to a similar conclusion with regard to a logical compatibility, even though he frames the atheist incompatibility challenge in a slightly different way. <clears throat> 
The final purpose of his discussion of Plantinga is rather subtle. He makes the incompatibility argument as logically as strong as possible with the result that the limits of philosophical argumentation become fully manifest. While the incompatibility problem can be solved on the logical level, Hermani argues and shows that it cannot be solved on the empirical level. While logically it may be consistent to say that the world is good with evils, it is not the least convincing to say this with regard to the experience of concrete evils. Aren't there numerous evils without which the world would be better? Again, Hermani undertakes a logical operation in which he demonstrates there, that there is no argument that can explain why certain concrete evils can contribute to the value of this world in such a way that it would be less valuable without them. He argues that the theist concept of God is necessarily linked with the assumption that the value of the real world cannot be surpassed by a possible world because the theist has to say that there is no better world than the real world. While this assumption is logical, there is no empirical evidence for, for or against it. Empirically, it is not evident why a world with earthquakes should be better with, uh, than without one. Therefore, he concludes that the empirical problem of theodicy cannot be solved, which consequently entails a philosophical reason for why few philosophers are against theodicy. As Michael Murray notes, quote, some philosophers have argued that there is something distasteful, prideful, or arrogant about any attempt to explain how or why God would permit evil. Those who find it distasteful serve either to blind us to the genuine horror um, that evil represents, or perhaps to console us in a way that deflates our enthusiasm for opposing it. End quote. In, in combining the insights from Plantinga and Hermani, one may conclude that there is sufficient philosophical reason not to develop a theodicy, but either to strictly refrain from a compatibility argument or even make a case against theodicy. Within this train of thought, I've justified in detail what I formulated aesthetically in lecture three. There is no rational answer to the theodicy problem. And any attempt at a rational answer creates the false notion that the problem is solved when it is penetrated philosophically. But the theodicy question is not solved until God overcomes suffering and evil. The biblical scriptures express the promise that God is able to do this and will do it. In the story of Job, this happens inwardly in this world. In the story of Jesus and his resurrection, God raises the hope of final redemption and reconciliation wherein his freedom lies. In these concrete events, there is the freedom of God's spirit, who according to Romans 8.17, bears with witness to our spirit claiming that we are children of God and that the whole creature will be delivered from this tra uh, travail. Unlike Barth, I would not describe this freedom as autonomy. Barth does this because he wants to make clear to idealistic philosophy, especially Fichte, um, that pure autonomy does not lie within humans, but with God. But God's freedom remains un underdetermined if it is understood in this way. In my opinion, it also remains underdetermined if one expands it to include the idea of covenant and says that God desires human to be covenant partners. I understand the freedom of God in the sense of self-limitation of the working of the spirit of which I spoke in the third lecture. God grants to the creatures their own existence, which contains within, uh, within it uh, the risk of independence. And this gaining of independence is counteracted by God's spirit again through Jesus in redemption and reconciliation. A third point, understanding human freedom. These considerations brings us, brings us to the final question for our time together. The question of human freedom. 
How should we actually understand the fact that human beings take on a life of their own vis-a-vis -vis God and assert themselves vis-a-vis -vis their fellow human beings in, a possible forms, in all possible forms and degrees of harshness? Can they avoid this? Do they have free will? In the Reformation, free will was rejected in matters of salvation, both by the Luther in De Servo Arbitrio and by Calvin. Both argue that humans become free only by believing the gospel message. For Calvin, the fundamental activity of this freedom is prayer, and ide uh, an idea that I, I, I can be traced directly into modernity. For Alvin Plantinga, on the other hand, an essential element in his, his defense of the compatibility of God's existence and existence of evil is that humans have free will and can choose otherwise. For our purposes here, I will address this dispute between Protestant and Catholic theologians in the German context. After the publication of Wolfhard Pannenberg's Anthropology and Theological Perspective, the Catholic systematic theologian Thomas Pröpper commented on Pannenberg's understanding of sin in a very clever and differentiated account of Pannenberg's approach. Following the line of the Reformation doctrine on sin, Pannenberg argued that both in anthropology and um, in systematic theology, one always finds oneself already entangled in sin and thus um, does not have the freedom to escape sin in the form of self-centeredness. To be sure, Pannenberg agrees with many modern Protestant theologians that the universality of sin cannot be explained by biological heredity. But he shows within the framework of his anthropology that the possibility of sin is given in the structure of human consciousness and is then also realized in the process of identity formation. Although Proper highly praises Pannenberg's anthropology on many points, he disagrees with this one point. His counter thesis is that humans choose and wills sin via, own, uh, via one's free will. He assumes there, um, there that freedom consists in the fact that the will is at first indifferent and then chooses something de definite, which is the capacity of freedom. Sin occurs because one chooses sin in an act of the free will. He could have chosen something else, <coughs> the will. Pannenberg, however, denies that the will is an initially indifferent, neutral faculty, which would imply that he, the will exists without willing anything. Luther had already objected to Erasmus that the will is a will in that it wills something. Here, then, there is a basic disagreement between Pröpper and Pannenberg about the, the understanding of the will and consequently a basic disagreement in the understanding of sin. According to Pannenberg, humans always already find themselves in pattern of behavior that incite them to be self-centered. According to Proper, humans have a choice, which is important to Proper for two reasons. First, in his view, humans are solely and exclusively responsible for sin. And second, for Proper, this autonomy of the human will is part of the signature of what you makes a human human. Thus, the question is about both the understanding of God and the understanding of humanity. Interestingly, both refer similarly to Kierkegaard. In Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard still works with the idealistic figure of self-positing. A person is free in self-liberation. At the same time, the dizziness of freedom catches up. The person is afraid to posit oneself because there is a fear of missing. Kierkegaard elaborates in Sickness to Death what failure is. Human are, humans are in a finite to infinite relation. It is <clears throat> humans are finite, but they uh, have their origin in God, the infinite. The person only wants to be herself, yet at the moment when she affirms herself, she misses herself, since she cannot affirm herself in any other way by, uh, than by self-positing. And thus, she misses her origin, God. She can only be desperately herself. Proper understands Kierkegaard as saying that humans have the capacity to posit themselves. 
Panberg understands Kierkegaard in such a way that this implementation has always already happened. So there is no neutrality. Freedom is only <clears throat> in implementation. It will surprise no one here if I find Panberg's interpretation more convincing. <laughs> It is not only true for Kierkegaard, in my view, but also corresponds to the Reformation thinking on freedom. And Kierkegaard wanted to translate the Reformation doctrine of sin and grace philosophically for his time. It seems at first glance, a glance that modern neuroscience proves the Reformation view right in its increasing decisive, uh, decisive denial for decades that humans possess free will. All processes of consciousness are neuronally, neuronally processed and are already pre-programmed by the neuronal networks. The Libet experiments and their successors show that even before we become conscious to implement a movement, the readiness potential is already built up, which makes the execution of the movement possible. Thus, it looks as if we were a programmed or determined machines, machines. But can a deterministic explanation of human life processes be combined with the biblical and reformation view of human free will? In my perspective, the problem is not to say that all processes of consciousness are completely neuronally processed. Determinism, however, is the problem. If imagine, uh, imaging techniques can predict that I'm about to raise my hand, okay, but can it also be fully predicted how I will respond when someone gives me a new piece of information that I didn't know previously? Aren't neural networks also altered by the imputing of information? This point is one of my further questions about the uh, a deterministic interpretation of neuroscientific scientific results. The second relates to sensation and self-awareness. It may be programmed really well that I find the right library, for example, but um, <clears throat> why, um, so nice, but why do I become aware of it as a positive sensation? What is the neurological sense of qualia and how can they be explained? The th third question relates to the meta level. Why does this idea that we are programmed irritate us so much? These questions should only be touched upon briefly here to illustrate that the Protestant understanding of freedom is caught between two fronts, to speak, so to speak. I think the dialogue with neuroscience is important, which is why within the framework of the Heidelberg Institute for Advanced Study, the Masilius Colleague, which is actually for Heidelberg people, um, uh, to, uh, for uh, different disciplines come together. I conducted a fellow project with the head of Heidelberg Psychiatry on the narrative coding of values. We, de we developed very short narratives longer are not possible in, um, uh, um, uh, in, in uh, lab. We develop very short um, uh, narratives <coughs> uh, I have to find my, um, um, in which a situation was described that triggers an empathic response and decision. These narratives were read to subjects under the scanner. They were asked to decide whether or not to provide assistance. The results showed that the narratives that recounted existential distress situations were processed differently in the brain than those in which non-existential situations were recounted. I cannot detail the very complex experimental design here, but it was clear to both of us that the narratives elicited empathic responses. I learned a great deal in this series of experiments about the tremendous number of components that must be considered in order to produce a distinctive result. But I also saw that narratives stimulate human consciousness and recall learning processes. And what theologian has ever denied that Christian preaching forms us and shapes our capacities for empathy? Of course, it does not conclusively settle the problem of freedom, not even for neuroscience. At any rate, nothing prevents me from understanding the effects of the word and the other mediums of the spirit as those 
in which we find truth, or to use Paul's phrase, in which the spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are God's children. Where this witness occurs, we become free. That is, we gain the freedom to understand ourselves accepted by God with our tendency toward self-assertion. This gain frees, uh, frees us for gratitude and to a new understanding of our fellow human beings whom we recognize in their diversity, just as we can accept ourselves with our sin. The community that grows out of this proce process is open and free. And where this can be perceived in an ecclesial community, it is attractive on a number of levels. Some concluding remarks. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to pre present my reflections on the dogmatics from a pneumatological perspective. <clears throat> they are work in progress and have been greatly enriched by your questions. I would like uh, Brent, uh, to thank Brandon Watson again, but also want li would like to mention my other um, uh, American student, um, a doctoral student, uh, Megan bedford strom um, She is from, uh, um, has a master from Yale and is now in Heidelberg. She works on God, gender, and dignity and in East African women's theologies, and I've le learned a great deal from her. Um, I would also like to extend my gratitude to Bruce McCormick, the president and the faculty for inviting me and giving me the privilege of presenting this year's Warfield Lectures. It truly was an honor. For me, the fellowship in the presence of this faculty and seminary has been inspiring in every way. <laughs>